The next few lectures are all going to be exploring the features of volcanic rocks. This is going to be a big heading in the notes. And over these next few lectures, we're going to be looking at this hybrid topic between petrology and volcanology. We're going to look, learn how rocks look because of the different volcanic processes that are affecting them. In the textbook, this is pages 241 to 279. And when I say, when I'm referring to the textbook in these lectures, I'm talking about Best's Petrology book. So Best is actually the last name of the author of a petrology textbook. And it's a good one, and it's the one I use for this class. Now, most of the time, magmas freeze out in the subsurface. And that creates an intrusive igneous rock with intrusive igneous rock textures. And we can learn so much about magmatic processes by interpreting those rocks. And of course, the same thing can be done with volcanic rocks that are able to escape the reservoir via dikes and sills and make their way to the surface. As we start our notes here, I just want to put this uh, like textural control reminder. We've already talked about all the things that control textures in all rocks, really. And the ones we need to remember here are viscosity and volatile, solubility, and then also nucleation and growth. And, and importantly, how disequilibrium, I'll just go diseq, will affect the amount of nucleation and growth and the relative battle between those two as we're creating crystals from a magma. So these are all things we've already talked about, and I want them to be in the forefront of your brain as we're talking about volcanic processes. So to get to the surface, magma has to have some special conditions. Most of the time, magma freezes out in that subsurface. So the next heading is we're going to talk about what special conditions or what are the reasons why magmas can reach the surface. And underneath this, we're going to have a capital A and a B and a C because there's three real ways that are mechanisms that allow, that help magma reach the Earth's surface. And one of them is going to be buoyancy, where the magma has a lower density than the surrounding crustal environment. And so there's going to be this drive to get the magma to the surface. So let's just say here magma has lower rho, where rho is density. And that's going to be a drive to get the magma to the surface. We can see maybe some of that here. Basaltic magma is escaping the earth in part. Oh, here actually we see evidence for bubbles. In fact, let's put the word bubbles here because as you start adding bubbles to a magma, that buoyancy is much more um, elevated because the density is going to go down. Now we see something else in this picture that helps magmas get to the surface. It's a necessary thing and that's cracking. If the magma is super buoyant but still doesn't have a pathway along a crack to move, right, a dike or a sill, it can't make it to the earth's surface. So cracking is going to provide a pathway to get the magma to the earth's surface. And then the last thing we'll put down here as a mechanism or thing that helps is the word overpressure. Overpressure can be related to buoyancy. It could also be related to um, excess volume or if the magma reservoir, right, imagine a balloon, you try to blow too much wa uh, water into the water balloon, the water balloon will eventually pop because it becomes overpressured. Same thing can happen to magma reservoirs. So this could be like uh, too much volume. If we get too much volume, it's got to squeeze its way out. Now all three of these actually are often working together in combination. Maybe one is more important than the other sometimes, but we want to be picturing all three of these as acting together in concert to help magmas reach the surface. Now when they do reach the surface, a volcano eruption occurs. And there are two main types of volcanic eruptions. One is explosive and the other is effusive. And we're going to start off with the effusive eruptions. These are the passive ones, the ones that don't kill as many people. They don't cause as much damage and destruction because they just ooze passively out of the ground as lava. Now we need to get some definitions out of the way. First of all, so what is lava? I guess we can do this as a definition here. We'll go to A, lava. Well, lava is nothing more than a coherent outpouring of melt on the Earth's surface. That's the way I'd like you to define it in your brain, as you teach other people later in your life, coherent outpouring of melt. It is at the Earth's surface. I guess that's implied by outpouring. And coherent means it hasn't been explosively disrupted. It's still 
a unit, not blown apart. And the reason why it does not blow apart is because of the gas and the behavior of the gas. And the key word about gas is uncoupled. The gas in the form of bubbles is uncoupled from the melt. So what this means is bubbles can escape because bubbles end up being this driving force for volcanic eruptions. Well, where did I go? Let's go scroll back to where we're supposed to be. There we go. So bubbles escape. How, do, how could we visualize this in a conduit? Let's say we have magma ascending. At some point, we reach the point of volatile X solution because we've reached the saturation point we get small bubbles those bubbles start to grow as we go to lower pressures but what can happen is those bubbles the gases can actually escape into the porosity and permeability of the wall rock by escaping they become uncoupled so this would be like uh, escape into wall rock the other way you could do it is if the bubbles like get big enough and they're buoyant enough, they'll actually rise really fast. They'll ascend faster than the magma is ascending. And by doing that, they become uncoupled. This is just to be like a bubble in a coke. The, the coke is such low viscosity that the bubble can escape through it really fast. So let's just say like bubbles ascend fast. Those would be two ways where we could uncouple gas from the melt and allow for a passive, effusive outpouring of melt in the form of a lava. The next big key parameter when we're talking about lavas is going to be viscosity because viscosity controls form. When I say form, I'm talking about morphology. What does the actual lava flow look like? Well, it's entirely controlled by viscosity. Most of the time, we talk about this in um, as aspect ratio. Now, I've introduced aspect ratio to you before in the form of magma reservoirs and how thick they are versus how long they are. And it's the same discussion here for lava flows, where we are going to put the thickness of the lava flow over the length of flow of the lava flow so that small numbers flow really far relative to their thickness and big numbers are actually like thick and sticky things that don't travel very far but but they're like really tall stacks of lava and so what we can have is we can have um, high aspect ratio lavas and low aspect ratio lavas and when we think about viscosity low aspect ratio has low viscosity they are thin flows that flow very far, whereas a high aspect ratio lava tends to have a high, aspect, uh, high viscosity because they can't flow far and they just stack up above the vent. We can picture this more scientifically and um, see the relation of different compositions with this image I took from a volcano textbook. And what we see in this graph and you could reproduce it really quickly if you wanted to. What we see in this graph is uh, the x-axis here, or the y-axis is thickness, and the x-axis is uh, diameter. And so by diameter, we're talking about like flow length. And the black domain here, this is basalt. And what this graph is telling us is that basalts can, can they never get very thick, but sometimes they flow not very far, and other times basalts travel really far. And so we would say basalts tend to have low aspect ratios. And everywhere in this kind of area of the graph would be low aspect ratio. And things that travel not very far and are very thick, these are things that are very high aspect ratio. And what we see is that more silicic lavas, rhyolites, trachytes, andesites, dacites, etc., they can be high aspect ratio. And that's how we would picture them because we know they're high viscosity. But there are circumstances on Earth that allow for them to be lower aspect ratio as well. But the general rule of thumb is basalts, mafic magmas are low aspect ratio, and the others are high aspect ratio. All right, so that's a good, more scientific uh, visualization. And this has just created a compilation of, of, look at that, hundreds of different actually measured lavas. 
Let's move on to Roman numeral four as we're closing in on the end of this first lecture. And I want to introduce to you now basaltic lavas. So this is Roman numeral four. There are a number of different forms that basaltic lavas can take. And there's specific names for these, and we'll discuss them. The first is Pahoehoe. All right, it looks like Pahoehoe, but it's actually pronounced Pahoehoe. And this is a low, like the lowest viscosity basaltic lava. And it tends to be smooth on the surface, and maybe sometimes it gets a little ropey in its texture. Let me show you some pictures of Pahoehoe before we move on. Here's a good example of smooth surface Pahoehoe lava flowing over older Pahoehoe lavas. That's actually would be considered distal from the vent. Uh-oh, this is, how am I going to stack these images here? Let's make this one maybe a little smaller. If we get closer to the volcano's vent, Pahoehoe actually can look like rivers of lava, but you still see it has a smooth surface, and here there's just more material, maybe a steeper slope so the material is moving faster. I guess what I want to do here is try to say some of this in your notes to go along with these pictures. Let's do this. So let's say we can have um, situations. Whoa, what happened there? We can have situations where the magma is near vent, and in the near vent situation, the pahoehoes tend to be channelized like a river, yeah? And because they're channelized, they, they might be more insulated, they lose less heat, sometimes they form lava tubes. These are some of the forms we'd expect if we're like trying to recognize pahoehoe, either in a picture or when, when we're in the field. And as we go further and further away from the vent to more distal positions, the lava starts to cool down. Maybe there's less material there. And we start to see these overlapping tongues and lobes. They're still smooth surface, but there's just not as much material. And so we would recognize this. And let's just write it like that. Let's say overlapping tongues. And by tongues, I just mean lobes of material. We may see things that uh, we're going to, let's see, boy, I love this guy, so let's put the word smooth here. Sometimes when we get down to this distal position, we start to see this kind of ropey texture that's forming on the surface of the pohoihoi as, as if the surface is kind of um, rumpling up upon itself. So this would be a picture that shows like an interesting ropey surface texture for a pohoihoi. Now there's another type of basaltic lava that's very, very common. It ends up being transitional to Pahoehoe, and it has a very easy spelling. It's called a a And what a a is, it's rough, and it's um, blocky, and it looks texturally totally different than Pahoehoe, even though compositionally it can be the same. Let's look at a picture of it before we actually describe it in the notes. So here's a really good picture of a a lava flowing on top of an earlier pahoehoe smooth surface flow. And one thing we see with this ah uh ah -uh is that it is this blocky, rough exterior. And that's something that I want to have down in your notes. And the other thing is, why is it so blocky and rough and angular like this? And that's because it's auto-brecciating, which means as it's flowing, it's breaking itself apart to produce these little blocks. And we call those clinker or scoria. So let's get some of that down in your notes. Let's say that this is an auto brecciating viscous flow. And this is how it's transitional with pahoehoe. As something is hot and starts to cool down or crystallize a little bit, the pahoehoe gets more viscous and its form changes in response. And so we'll have ah uh ah -uh is auto brecciating viscous flow, the exterior is rough and it has um, sharp vesicular blocks. Those are blocks that are broken apart by itself as it's auto brecciating and moving. Now we call those blocks scoria. Sometimes we call them also clinker. 
and clinkers because this actually if you were to hear not a moving you can hear this clinking noise as all those blocks are banging in to one another now i would like to draw um with you before we finish up right here here's a ground surface and we have lava that is moving like this and it's breaking and shattering apart and so what ends up happening is this dense interior of the lava starts to break and shatter on its exterior bits and then those exterior bits just kind of fall down in front of it and then the lava flow will just kind of move flow right over top of the previously auto brecciated material so this is what we would expect to see if we were to see a cross section through an ah uh -uh, where there is a dense interior of lava that's moving and then there's auto brushier material that is breaking off and falling down and it's rolling over itself a good way to think about this would be like tank tread or like uh, what do we call these like backhoes right that have the tanks um, the tank treads that allow it to move the other thing in the rock record is we'd expect to see a stratigraphy right we don't see one moving but we see one from five million years ago well we'd expect to see this dense interior which is sandwiched between a uh, broken part right and another um, I guess we should say scoria we should see scoria dense basalt and then more broken scoria above it and that would be a good way to recognize ah on the field all right, so next time we'll pick up with a few other special types of basaltic lava.